Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to module three of the CompTIA A Plus course. This module is titled Troubleshooting PC Hardware. If you're not sure what version of A Plus this is, this is based on the 1100 series of A Plus. Now, as for the main sections we'll be looking at in this specific module or covering in this module, that would be apply troubleshooting methodology. So in other words, what is the troubleshooting steps one would follow when it comes to troubleshooting something and what does it actually entail? The second main section will be troubleshoot power and disk related issues. The third and the last main section in this module will be troubleshoot system and display related issues. If you guys are brand spanking new to this channel, those three items I've listed is simply the three main sections in this module. It is not the only things we'll be covering in this module. If you would like a more accurate list of what gets covered in this module, you can find that in the video description down below with some very cool convenient timestamps there for you guys. I put a lot of effort and time into getting those timestamps for you guys, so feel free to go and use that if you would, would like to just look up a specific topic or if you'd like to revise on a specific topic. All right, so since we are talking about people that's brand spanking new to the channel, if you guys haven't done it already, please give the video a like. Like I said in the other videos, it does help me, it does help this video, so then when the end of the day we can help more people. And if you'd like to know when I release other modules for this specific course or just videos in general for other courses, remember to obviously subscribe as well. All right, folks, let's stop wasting time and get straight to that first main section of this module, which was apply troubleshooting methodology. Now, as I said earlier, when I listed the three main sections we'll be covering, this is all about the steps one would follow when it comes to troubleshooting some sort of issue IT related. These steps is normally what we as computer technicians slash engineers would follow. It's not really what the average user would do. Although there's no rule that says the user can do these steps, but for the most part, this is more applicable to the IT guy, if you want to go and call it something. So what are the steps at the moment? There's six of them. If you go look at the very old versions of A+, like the 600, 700 series, there used to be, I think, just four steps back then. I can't remember. I've been in IT way too long. But at the moment, there are six steps. I'm going to list them for you guys, and I'm going to elaborate on these six steps for you guys. It's very, very important that you guys know these steps for your exam. I can pretty much guarantee you're going to get asked about this in the exam. So not only should you know the six steps, you need to know in which order they are and what it entails and why you need to go and do each of these specific steps. All right, so straight down to business, what is the first step out of these six steps? That, folks, would be, number one, identify the problem. I think you guys would have been able to guess that one, right? So the very first thing we need to do is we need to try and figure out what the cheese is the problem. So this could be your own machine, but I think for the purpose of this video, you know, for this course, let's imagine this is for one of your users, a potential client, a potential customer. He or she is complaining, moaning in other words, about some sort of issue, problem with their machine, their laptop, their desktop, whatever it might be. So I'm going to try and keep this as simple as I possibly can. Let's use the example of their machine does not want to start. The user or the client or the customer is complaining to us, their machine just does not want to turn on. Now, at first, that means it could literally be anything. It could be maybe there's something wrong with the machine hardware-wise. It could be that there is a power issue. It could be that there's something wrong with the machine software-wise the list of things that could possibly be when it comes to the machine that doesn't want to start is insanely long, folks. So we need to try and identify what the problem could be. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start off by asking questions. One of the best ways you can try and identify a problem for a machine is to ask questions. Now, yes, there's going to be cases where you cannot ask the user questions, but most of the time you're going to see you're going to be lucky. You're going to be able to ask the user questions. Now, what kind of questions do we ask? You're wondering. Well, 
That will be questions like, sir, ma'am, when last did this machine work? Kind of like a detective. You can kind of imagine yourself like with a little notepad there with a pen. Um, so imagine yourself as being like a little detective, a PC detective, if you want to call it something. And now you're going to start off by asking the user questions like, ma'am, sir, when last did this computer of yours work? When last did it turn on successfully? Now, for the purpose of this example, let's say the user says the machine was fine up until last night. It was working perfectly fine last night. This morning, when they tried to turn the machine on, the machine is, well, not working, obviously. Now you're going to ask other questions like, ma'am, sir, did you change anything on the machine hardware-wise in the last day or so? And if they said no, you can go and ask questions like, ma'am, sir, did you by any chance install, uninstall anything on the machine recently? Did you by any chance change any configurations or settings on the machine recently? So, yeah, and you might find that sometimes you get lucky with the first question or two, other times, still, no dice, it's not going to work. Now, during this questionnaire of mine, imagine for a moment the user says, okay, my machine was working fine up until last night, so we've established it's something that happened between last night and this morning. And now they might say, oh, no, it was working fine until last night, ever since we had that storm last night. So, not sure if you guys are following my drift here, but when there's a storm, that's very often the cause of the problem. As you guys might have been, been able to guess here, storms normally cause electricity, you know, in the form of surges or spikes. Sometimes the lightning will strike, you know, power lines. That's a massive surge and it ends up blowing or hurting certain components. Other times it's just surges that take place. You never know. So generally it's recommended, this is just off topic by the way, that people go and unplug their devices from the socket, the wall socket, in the case of an electrical storm. So now the fact that the user tells me the machine was working last night and it was working ever since that storm took place, that leads me to believe it is most likely a power related issue and you know considering it's a power related issue and that it's lightning related i suspect it's most likely going to be a power supply issue the actual psu device in the compu computer so it's it's a power supply issue if it's not a power supply issue it's maybe a motherboard issue or it's all of the above it's a power supply and a motherboard issue so usually in the case of a power issue, it is the PSU, power supply unit, that goes first, that kicks the bucket first. So that is the problem, at least that's what I suspect it might be. So that is point one, guys. Point one, identify the problem. How do we do that? One of the best ways would be to go and ask questions. You can also go and alternatively just do a couple of tests if you want to. Go and plug things in, plug things out, verify the power's plugged in, verify switches are turned on, that kind of stuff. Now that brings us to step two here. That, folks, is establish a theory. And I kind of accidentally covered that one if you think about it. So after asking my questions, the user told us, what did they tell us? The machine worked up until last night, ever since that lightning storm. So now based on that information, I'm going to establish a theory. What is my theory? My theory is the lightning storm caused some sort of shenanigans, the lightning storm probably caused some sort of surge, and as a result, my PSU, or in this case, the user's PSU, has kicked the bucket. I'm not saying that is the, the, the problem here, but that is my theory. And I'm going to go and test my theory now, which brings us to step three. I'm going to go and test it. If it turns out not to be that, you know, let's say it's not the power supply, then you start all over again at step one and step two. If you go and test the theory, and if it turns out to be that problem which you guessed it might be, then you would move on to step four, which would be to establish a plan of action. In other words, how do you go about remedying the situation? Now going back to step three there, so let's not cover step four quite yet. So when it comes to testing your theory, you know, since we're talking about a power supply here, you are going to go and remove the other power supply, or at the very least just plug it out, Get yourself a working power supply that you know for a fact is working. A brand spanking new one or a working one from another machine. Plug it into that machine. You can even just hold it on top of that machine. Plug it in and press the power button. See if the machine starts. If it starts, well, there you go. It's the power supply. 
If it does not start, that means it's something else or it's the power supply and something else. At the very least, it's not just the power supply. Now, for the purpose of this demonstration, let's say you plugged in another working power supply and presto, behold, the machine is now turning on. Now we know, okay, great. It is the power supply that is at fault here. That is the one that we need to go and fix or replace for the most part. That brings us to step four here, establish a plan of action. Are we going to repair the device or are we going to replace the device? That's a very famous question you guys are going to ask yourself a lot in IT. Sometimes it's better to repair. Sometimes it's better to replace. Sometimes you don't really have a choice in the matter. Now, is it possible to repair a power supply? Yes, it most certainly is. Should you though? No, you most definitely would not want to go and do that. These power supplies, first of all, are so freaking cheap, guys. If you're going to go and check the labor alone to go and fix that power supply, just the labor alone is going to cost you way more than what a power supply, a brand new one, is going to cost you. So that just that alone is enough to justify just getting a new one. Now, even if you are willing to go and repair it, let's say you've got money to throw around, maybe, I don't know, maybe you just really want to go and fix the old power supply, it's still not something we would advise because normally once you go and fix it, it doesn't last as long as a new one, you know, that you just bought. And quite frankly, guys, it's very dangerous. Only electricians can go and open power supplies. Yes, you are a technician, you are a specialist, but you are a technician or a specialist when it comes to IT and computers, not electricity. Unless one of you guys happens to be a qualified electrician, I do not want one of you guys opening a power supply that is not worth it. It's going to put your life at risk. Even if that device is plugged out, something we did mention in the previous two modules, even if it's plugged out, it still stores very large quantities of electricity in its capacitors. And when you touch the wrong thing in there, they can either explode or they can, you know, just discharge very violently. So this is going to result in you either being in ICU or, well, in a coffin. Not something we want to do. Let's not do that. So guys, all in all, when it comes to power supplies, the recommendation here is go and replace, not repair. Now, even though it's pretty obvious that you should go and replace it, you cannot just go ahead and do that because depending on the customer or the client or the user, you might not be allowed to go and do that without their permission. So if it's for your company, you're probably going to be allowed to go do that because you are the technician for your company. You can go ahead and do it as long as the user just gets a working machine at the end of the day. But if this is for a customer, a client or something in that regard, you know, for another company, you can't just go and willy nilly replace the power supply. What if they don't have the money? You basically have to go and inform the customer or the user first, ma'am, sir, this is what it turned out to be the problem. I've done the following tests. This is what we've come across. The problem seems to be your power supply. The best course of action and the cheapest course of action here would be to replace your power supply. You mention to them what the costs associated would be and you basically get the green light from them first because maybe it's been a long month, it's been a rough month for that customer and they really can't afford it. They're going to have to come back next month and at least then they can tell you, you know what, sir, I don't have the money right now. Let's do it next month. Um, or alternatively, they might tell you, hey, it's fine, go ahead. No, normally, they'll tell you, go ahead, because it's very cheap to go and replace the power supply. Now, once you've done all of that, which is now step four, that brings us to step five of the six steps, which is verify full system functionality. Now, some of you guys might argue with me here and say, hey, I've done this a million times. You know, let's say it's a power supply you have to go and fix. I know what I'm doing. I know the machine is going to work. I'm not going to go and test it. Well, that might be, maybe you have done this a million times and you might be an expert that's been, that's been doing this, you know, more times than you probably care to care to admit. But that's not what it's about. It's not just because of that. It's, you know, we do make mistakes as humans, but it's to make sure the customer or the user sees of their own eyes this device is working. And if they do and when they do, I want you guys, if at all possible, to get them to acknowledge this in writing. Don't just get them to acknowledge this verbally because what happens in some cases, and I've seen this more times in my life than I care to admit, some of these users, which are very nice and very friendly, they'll see it with their own eyes that it's working. And eventually afterwards, something's going to happen again to that machine. They'll break it or something's going to happen. <clears throat> and when that happens, they're going to turn around and stab you in the back and say, no, this machine never worked when they got it back. 
ever since you had this machine, the following is happening, or this doesn't work, or that doesn't work. People like to do that, and it's people that you often least expect it from. So to cover yourself, guys, really, really good life advice here. Get it in writing. So when you fix that machine, and we know you guys are going to be able to fix that machine, show the customer that it's working. We know it's going to work, but we want them to see it. You turn that machine on, you show them that it's working, and normally on a ticket or a job card or something, you make them acknowledge, you make them sign that it's working. So this job card or ticket is normally where we specify what the original problem was that the customer came in with. We specify the tests that we conducted, and we specify what the solution ended up being and what was done, and that the machine is now in fully working condition, and that the user has seen that it's in fully working condition. Then we make them sign for it. Very often you'll find some companies will use that same piece of document to go and invoice the customer or the user or something afterwards. So this is the end of the day, not just for invoicing purposes, but most importantly, to protect yourself. I cannot emphasize enough how important this, guys, is. Guys, this is very important. This is like doing backups. It is something that we all must live and abide by. And that brings us to the very last step here, which I would say is not the most important one, but it is still pretty important. That, guys, is document your findings. Now, not a lot of companies does this, but it is pretty neat to go and do that. I used to work for a, an IT company where it was a company that specialized in IT. I'm not going to mention their name here. You know, I don't want to get into trouble by mentioning any company names. But I worked for a company as a senior engineer, and the, the purpose of that company was to service other companies. Other companies that don't have any IT support, or some of them do, but they don't really know what they're doing, or they're not allowed to go and do it. And whenever I went to a customer, a user, a client, and I found a problem which was very, very weird, very out of the ordinary, I would normally document my findings. I would document what the problem was. I would document all the steps I took. And I would document what the, uh, the final solution ended up being. And the reason I did that, and this was not a requirement by that company. This is just something I did on my own. It was my own initiative. Is sometimes about six months later, you would go to the same customer, client, or another customer or client, and they would have the exact same problem. Now, because of this problem being so unique, so weird, or so rare, chances are you're probably not going to remember what the problem was, and you're probably not going to remember what the solution was. And this happened to me quite a few times, and I got very irritated by it. So, you know, there's nothing more frustrating getting to another client six months later and seeing a problem and realizing that you have had this problem before, you know for a fact that you have fixed this problem before, but for the life of you, you cannot remember what the problem was and you cannot remember what the solution was. That is a very, very frustrating and annoying feeling. It's like on the tip of your tongue, but you just don't know what it was. And ever since I experienced that, I figured to myself, you know what, there's gotta be an easier way. I hate this experience, I hate this feeling. Let me document it. So I didn't document all my findings, no. If it was a normal everyday problem, I wouldn't go and do it. But it was specifically those unique, those weird and those rare issues. Those are the ones that I went and documented myself. How you do it is up to you. I literally just saved it in notepad files. Honest to God, that's what I did, guys. I had a folder on my computer that said problems or something like that. I had different folders for each customer of mine. And in those folders, I had just normal notepad files with like a more or less description of what the problem was. And then in the notepad file itself would be detailed steps of what the problem was and all that kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, how you guys go about it is completely different. There are many companies out there, and this is now legit, which will actually require it from you to go document your findings. It's a compulsory requirement at company. This could be something as simple as a computer store. So in a computer store, if a client or a customer brings the machine in, you are supposed to document your finding after. So whether you were able to fix that machine or not is irrelevant. So let's say for argument's sake, you were able to fix that machine. You need to document who the customer was, what the problem was that they initially reported, and then all the steps you took and what the final solution ended up being. So the reason why we go and document that is for many reasons. It's in case the customer comes back afterwards and wants to moan and groan about the issue. It's also in the event of another customer coming in with a similar issue. You can then go back to your own findings or another user, another technician in that computer store can go through your findings and they might find something useful in your notes or you might find something useful in their notes. 
Maybe this is an issue that took another technician in the store a whole freaking day to solve. And instead of it taking you a whole day to solve, it can take you a mere five minutes because you just went and looked for their notes. Isn't that cool? All right, guys, that brings us to the end of the first main section in module three. And now we can safely move on to the second main section, which is troubleshoot power and disk related issues. So when we say disk, for the most part, we're referring to hard drives, guys. It's not limited to hard drives, but for the most part, that is what is being referred to here. All right, so in this section, the first topic up is troubleshoot power issues or power related issues, should I say. So I think let's start at the beginning, no power symptoms. So these are some of the possible symptoms you, your user, your customers, your clients can possibly experience when it comes to having no power. The first one would be no indicator lights. So when you or they go and press the power button on this machine, no lights are coming on. So there's normally at the very least some sort of lights on the laptop or the desktop machine that comes on to indicate that the machine is running. Another way we know when the machine is running is as soon as you or the user presses the power button, you can normally hear some sort of fan starting up. And this is also the case for laptops even. I know laptops are very, very quiet by nature, but even of laptops to a certain degree, you can normally hear some sort of fan starting up. They're very, very quiet, but if you listen carefully, you can hear them. So when there's no lights coming on or no fans coming on, or quite frankly, all of the above, that could be an indicator that this machine has no power. Now it's up to you to go and figure out why the heck it has no power. Now something I want to bring to your attention, which is not really the topic at hand here, it's just something I want to mention to you guys. Just because the lights of a machine does not come on, does not necessarily mean that it has no power. Especially if you look at something like a desktop computer. With desktop computers, something you guys need to be aware of, the lights in the front of the case, all those fancy little lights that comes on when you press the power buttons, that is simply a one little cable, we call it a jumper cable, that plugs into the motherboard. So as soon as you press the power button, the motherboard provides power through that little cable to all the little cool little lights in the front of the case or the top of the case. Now there are technicians out there that are lazy or quite frankly just don't care about plugging that cable in. So that means when you press the power button, the machine is going to work perfectly fine, the lights just won't come on. So just because you see no lights does not necessarily mean there's an issue or at least it's not the issue you might think because some folks are lazy or forgetful or just don't care when it comes to plugging in that little jumper cable. So one of the things I would ask you guys to go and do, especially when it comes to desktop PCs is when you open the side panel, verify that the cable coming from the front of the chassis is indeed plugged in to the motherboard jumper. All right, now that I've got that off my chest, let's move on to possible causes for a machine um, that, you know, when it comes to power issues and all that. So this could be something like a circuit fault or a power blackout. So circuit fault is normally the actual circuit in your home, your office building, you know, wherever the heck you might be of that machine. So maybe the circuit that you've plugged it into, maybe there's some sort of fault in it. It could be that there's nothing wrong with the device. Believe it or not, this has actually happened to me once or twice in my life, not a lot. I've been in IT for probably like two decades now. And this once upon a time, I went to a printer store. They don't just do printing, but it's one of the main things they specialize in. They had these huge printers, you know, slash scanners, slash faxes and all that. And the main thing they, they do in this store is when people come in, they would go and print stuff for people. They probably had between six and 10 of these machines. And I had to go out to this store and one of their big printers just refused to come on. You know, normally we try and help them over the phone first or remotely first, and this was, well, not successful as you might guess. So I went out to the customer and pressed though the machine really does not want to come on. Eventually, I ended up moving this machine to another location. I can't even remember what the reason was. I think I was in the way or something. And as I moved the machine to a different wall socket, I thought, okay, let me move this printer. I'm going to put it one side in the store, plug it into a different wall socket where I can go and work in peace, not in anyone's way. And as I started, you know, testing again, I noticed the machine is now turning on. And I thought to myself, what the heck just happened? Because I have not implemented any solutions yet. I quite frankly haven't even figured out yet what was wrong with it because I did verify that it was plugged into the wall. I did verify that everything was turned on. All of that was verified and confirmed, but yet it was not turning on. And now I moved the printer because I was basically in the way, if I remember correctly. And I plugged it in again, 
turned it on again, and behold, it was now turning on. So I figured to myself, you know, what the heck is going on here? What's different? What was different? The wall socket. The circuit was different. So it turns out that that circuit, there was a fault on that circuit. That, that socket was faulty. And that's one of the reasons why the printer didn't want to work. There was nothing wrong with the printer, believe it or not. Another issue is it could be a power blackout. And this is something surprisingly we have every day in my country. So in my country, we know what blackouts are. But in a lot of other countries, these are quite rare. So a blackout is when a certain area is without power. This could be for a very long period of time. Short period of time could just be a couple of buildings, could be a whole block, could be a whole suburb, could be a whole regional area. Um, so in my case, in my country, it's like whole sections, of the whole country would go without power for the most part. So it's just, you know, it's not cool. Other possible causes could be a socket fault. That one we did mention to you guys already. So socket slash sit fault. This could also be switches and cables or connectors. So that could also be a problem. So when we say switches, we mean power switches. We're not talking about network switches here, guys. We're talking about power switches, like a light switch, we're crying out loud. The switch you would find next to the socket where you unplug in your power cables, that kinds of switches. The cables we're talking about is power cables, not necessarily network cables. We're not talking about networking here, guys. We're talking about power related issues, power cables, power connectors. And then lastly, guys, another one I want to add here for you guys is overloaded and faulty devices. Now it goes about saying the four items we've got listed here, well it's actually a little bit more than four if you look carefully, those four items is obviously not the full list. It can be a lot of other things which is not mentioned here. So, but yeah, getting back to the fourth item there, overloaded, so this could be something that's very overloaded, maybe that circuit is overloaded, and what happens when you overload a circuit? It's going to trip. This normally happens at the circuit breaker, and this is normally due to, you know, that circuit breaker only being able to handle a certain al- amount of amps, if you guys know what amps is. Not something you guys are required to know for this course, because that's moving more into an electricity power kind of field, and we are trying to cover the IT aspect about this. But in short, when you go and plug a lot of devices into the same circuit and they draw too much power, it's going to trip that circuit, and the idea here is you need to try and spread them out to different sockets on different circuits, so they fall onto different switches and all that. Right, and then the last topic I want to add here when it comes to troubleshooting your power issues is power supply testing. Now, there's many ways you can go about this. Sometimes you might get lucky. I've seen in some computer stores and stuff, they actually have a legit power supply tester. So after someone complains their power supply is not working or the machine is not working, if and when it comes down to testing the power supply, you would disconnect it from the motherboard and everything else in that computer and you would plug in your power supply tester directly into that power supply, and it's going to show you with little light indicators whether the power supply is faulty or not. Now, realistically, 9 out of 10 times, or actually more than 9 out of 10 times, guys, you're not going to be that lucky. You're not going to have a power supply tester. So how the heck do you go about testing the power supply? Well, substitute it with one that you know is working, like I said earlier. So if you suspect the power supply is at fault, take it out or unplug it, Get a working one that you know for a fact is working. Plug it into that machine and check if you get any different results. If you do, well, then you know it was the power supply. If you don't get different results, then you know, okay, well, it's um, either something else that's wrong or it's the power supply and something else that's at fault here. All right, folks, moving on to our next topic in this module. That will be troubleshooting post issues. So in case you guys are not familiar with POST, we're not talking about the POST office. (laughs) No, not that one. So POST is an abbreviation for something in IT. It stands for Power on Self-Test. All servers do this, all desktop PCs does this, all laptops does this. So the most common place you would hear this, yes, you can actually hear it, is on a desktop machine. Although on some laptops, you can also sometimes to a certain degree hear it. So when you press the power button on the average desktop machine, One of the very first things you or the user would hear in the first couple of seconds is a beep. One beep. So as soon as I press the power button as a now, one or two seconds later I hear a beep. And that is to indicate that the machine, at the very least the machine's hardware, is in working condition. That's a good sound. So one beep is normally a good sound. It tests itself. So you can basically imagine when you press the power button, the machine is kind of like doing like a roll call. It's basically saying, hello. Power supply, are you there? Power supply says, yes, I'm here. I'm ready to go. It says, okay, cool, check. It's got like a little clipboard. 
and says, okay, motherboard, are you there? Are you ready? Motherboard says, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. Sounds like SpongeBob in the ocean. Then it asks the CPU, then it asks the netter card, and then the graphics card, and then the hard drive, and so on and so forth. And if everything is ready and in good working condition, you get one solid beep indicating that the machine is in fact working. Now, unfortunately, there's certain things that you would not get a beep for if they are not working. Um, one of the things is, ironically, the power supply. You should actually not have mentioned the power supply. Because if the power supply is not working, there is no power. If there is no power, there is no power to make the beeping sound. Another component you would not get a beep for, you know, at least in most cases you will not get a beep, is a faulty motherboard. Because the speaker, the little speaker that makes the beep, is physically on the motherboard. And if the motherboard is at fault here, at least 9 out of 10 times if the motherboard's at fault, you will also not get a beep because the thing that makes the beep is the thing that's at fault here. <laughs> so that's a kind of catch too. But the things you can expect the beep for is things like your network card, your graphics card, your RAM, hard drive, CPU, overheating, that kinds of stuff. So for that, yes, you can expect some sort of beep. The beep is a BIOS code. So we're going to get to that in just a moment. That's actually the third topic here. We're still on the first topic here. So the beep is a BIOS code. So post in short, guys, is power on self-test. Your laptop desktop or server is simply just checking if everything is there and if everything is seated properly in a good working condition. You want to hear one solid beep. Anything other than one solid beep is bad. Although with laptops, you're not going to hear a beep most of the time. So don't go into a panic if you're using a laptop. Now moving on to the second topic here, black screen. If you or the user gets a black screen, well, this can mean a lot of things, you know. It could really just be a matter of the screen is broken. But that is not what CompTIA has in mind for this course. So the three things mentioned by CompTIA is failed firmware update. Now, I can partially confirm that. Um, there has been cases where I would do a firmware update and after doing it, it will just fail. You know, the, the device would not turn on or the firmware update itself would fail and that could really cause a bunch of shenanigans. Second one is a faulty cable connector or device. So maybe there's a display cable or a power cable that's not plugged in properly. Maybe the connector is bent. Could be that some sort of device is not working properly. Maybe the actual screen itself, maybe the monitor is not working properly. And the third item we've got it here is a faulty PSU or CPU. That can also cause a screen just to display black. Now moving on to a third topic inside here, that would be the beep codes I was just talking about. BIOS beep codes. Now we still call them BIOS beep codes, even though most motherboards don't actually use BIOSes anymore. So up until more or less, I would say maybe between 2012, 2015 somewhere, was the transitioning phase where about 50-50 of motherboards would have either a BIOS or the new replacement, which is a UFI. Nowadays, all new motherboards you buy does not have a BIOS, Instead, they have what we call a UFI, guys. So getting back to the actual codes at hand here, if something is wrong with the machine hardware-wise, those certain things we just mentioned earlier to you guys, you would get some sort of code other than the one solid beep we were talking about. It might be one long continuous beep, or it might just be a lot of little short rapid beeps or a combination of long and short rapid beeps. Depending on what beeping code you get, that will essentially tell you what is wrong with this machine hardware-wise. Now, I cannot tell you what the codes are because it actually, believe it or not, varies from make to make and from model to model and all that kinds of stuff. So if you are using, for example, an Intel motherboard and you get one long beep, it does not necessarily mean the same as me getting a long beep when I have an Asus motherboard. So it does vary from make to make and from model to model. So depending on the code you get, I would first tell you guys or advise you guys to go and check what make of motherboard you're using. It's not that important to check the model from what I've seen. It's more important to check the make. So if you're using an Intel, go check what that code means for Intel. If you're using a Gigabit, go check for Gigabit. If you're using Asus, go check for Asus. I'm just using those as examples. It's obviously not limited to those guys. So first go and check what motherboard brand are you or the user using. And then once you've established that, then you can go and look up the code for that brand of motherboard. 
Anywho, moving on to our next topic here, folks. Troubleshoot boot issues. In other words, what could be possible problems or issues or causes for someone's machine not to start up? Now, if I have to give you a real life list for the possible causes that can cause that, we would probably never finish this course. But we're going to try and keep it as close as possible to the CompTIA course, and we're going to try and keep it as close as possible to what is covered in the slides and the book and what you need to know for this particular exam. But just know in real life, it can actually be a lot more, guys. So when it comes to the boot device, that is the actual device that your machine or the user's machine is booting from. Most commonly, this would be the hard drive of the machine. Where is Windows most commonly, guys, or the operating system? It's most commonly located on the hard drive. It gets installed onto the hard drive of that machine. And when the average person presses their power button, that machine is going to go and look on the hard drive for whatever operating system is installed on that hard drive. It's going to find it there. It's going to boot from there. There you go. End of story. Now, boot device is not limited to hard drive, though, guys. What if you or that user would like to reload that machine completely from scratch? In other words, a wipe and load is what we sometimes call that. Or what if you or the user would like to install the operating system for the very first time? Can you boot from the hard drive then? No, because there's nothing on the freaking hard drive. It might be a brand new hard drive that's blank. Or maybe you or the user is about to go and reload a hard drive, which means you can also not boot from the hard drive. So other possible places you can go and boot from is places like a memory drive, flash drive, you know, USB stick. It's got so freaking many names, it's hard to keep track these days. It could also be a DVD, which used to be one of the most common methods up until not too long ago. Nowadays, you'll find half of the machines don't even come out of an optical drive. So it could be a flash drive. It could be a DVD. It could be over the network. The point is you can boot from multiple destinations and multiple devices, guys. Many moons ago, like 20, 30 years ago, you could even boot from a floppy disk drive. If anyone even knows what that is, I don't think anyone these days knows what a floppy disk is. But it was possible, believe it or not, to boot from something called a floppy disk. You will absolutely not get asked about floppy disks in this exam because that's super legacy. But if you are curious what that is, feel free to go and Google what a floppy is and what a floppy disk drive is. You know, just to, basically for a trip down memory lane. Now, getting back to the actual topic at hand here, which is boot issues. If a device does not want to boot, there is a possibility that you or the user has gotten the boot sequence wrong. In other words, what is the order in which this machine needs to go and look for an operating system? Maybe the operating system is in the DVD. It's on a DVD. It's in the optical drive. There is nothing on the hard drive or the one on the hard drive is faulty or something in that regard. But at the moment, the machine is configured to look on the hard drive first. It's configured to boot from the hard drive first. If that is the case, and it needs to boot from the hard drive first, but yet you need it to boot from a DVD, that could be a, uh, an example for boot sequence problem. You need to go into the BIOS, or nowadays it's the UFI, and change the boot order, is what we call it. Sometimes referred to as the start order, or the boot sequence order, but I think in most cases it's just called the boot order. Other possible issues when it comes to boot device is power and data connectors and cabling. So if you look at something, let's say like a hard drive, it's most commonly going to be an issue regarding your hard drive. The hard drive where the operating system is installed. Maybe the power cable to that hard drive is not plugged in or connected properly. Maybe the data cable is not plugged in connected properly. This is most likely going to be a SATA cable when, it, when we talk about data. In the old days, it used to be a PATA cable. In other words, the old IDE cables, which we discussed in the previous modules to you guys. Other possible main issues it could be when it comes to boot issues is boot sector. So maybe the boot sector of that machine is damaged. It's got nothing to do with the brand of hard drive, the model of hard drive, the size of hard drive, the age of hard drive, or even quite frankly, sometimes the usage of the hard drive. It really, really is random, guys. I worked in IT long enough and with enough hard drives to be able to tell you there's no brand when it comes to hard drives that's better than the other ones. Really, it is not. When we talk about the type of hard drive, yes, there's a distinct difference. So if you were to go and compare the old mechanical hard drives to solid state hard drives and hybrid hard drives, yes, big differences between them, especially when it comes to their the benefits and their drawbacks. 
But if, assuming that it's the same type of hard drive and you're just looking at brands and sizes, guys, there's no difference. Really, there is not. So when I used to work in the field, I would sell all the brands and all the sizes you can possibly imagine. Sometimes brand one would have all of them come back as a comeback because all of them are faulty. It's a factory fault. And then the week after that, none of them come back because the factory solved the issue. And then a month later, now suddenly brand two. I'm just giving them numbers. I don't want to mention any brand by name here. So brand one is the first one where almost all of them comes back. This has happened to me. I've had comebacks with all the brands and I've had cases where all the brands would have no comebacks. It's completely, completely random. But it normally happens in bursts where there would be no, 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 no comebacks. And then suddenly one week, all of those hard drives that I sold for one particular brand come back because it's a factory fault. It's kind of like a bunch of duds. And now we basically have to go and refund the customers or give them new ones or something in that regard. And then suddenly it's good again, it's good again for another six months. And then, and then there's another batch of duds again. And this happened with all brands. All the major brands you guys have familiar with. This happens with them all. You've got no control over that. You never know when that's going to happen. All you can do is buy a hard drive and just hope for the best. So there is no hard drive that's better than the other when it, when it comes to brand. And when we talk about other kinds of hardware like CPUs, motherboards, power supplies, screens, that kind of stuff. Yes, there is cases where one brand might be better than the other one. I'm not going to mention any brands here because I am not doing promotion. This is free training after all. I'm not here to promote anything. The only thing I might promote is my own channel. <laughs> not that I'm getting anything out of this. Anyway, guys. Um, another main thing it could possibly be is operating system errors and crash screens. So that could be a problem as well. So maybe there was an operating system. It was working, but now this operating system is getting some sort of error. The reason for the error, the reason for the cache screen can, can be a lot of things. It could just be something hardware related, could be something software related, could be a power issue, could be an overheating issue. The list of things it could be is infinite. That is where you are going to come in. You're going to ask questions. You know, remember, identify the problem. Step one was to identify the problem. And how do we do that? One of the best ways is to ask questions. And then you're going to go and test your theory. You're going to establish a theory. You're going to test your theory. All that kind of stuff. Remember those steps. Very, very important. All right, guys. Moving on to our next topic, which is the last topic in section two, but not the last topic for this module. So this topic is troubleshoot drive availability. So the drives we're talking about is for the most part going to be the hard drives you would find in your laptop and your desktop. So one of the first issues and one of the main issues the average Joe would encounter is unusual noises. Now just because you or the user are hearing noises does not necessarily indicate that there's a problem. Especially if you could look at desktop hard drives and even more so if you look at the big desktop mechanical hard drives. Something like a two terabyte, three terabyte and up. Those hard drives, especially of certain brands, they tend to make a lot of noise. So as soon as you start the machine or as soon as you or the user tries to access something on that hard drive, if it happens to be a secondary hard drive, you'll start hearing it spinning up and you'll hear a lot of noise coming from the hard drive. Does not necessarily indicate though that there's a problem with the hard drive. So there's a difference between, you know, just the hard drive spooling up and a clicking noise, for example. So if you try to access something on a secondary drive and you can start hearing the hard drive spooling up, that is normal because it's building up revolutions so that it can find the information that you or the user is looking for. If you're starting your PC up, you know, and this happens to be your main hard drive, but it also happens to be a very big hard drive and you can hear it spinning up and building revolutions, that is not normally something you need to worry about. When you or the user needs to start worrying is when you start hearing noises like clicking sounds. If you start hearing clicking sounds, guys, that is a bad sign. That means the hard drive has either failed or it's about to fail. Usually when you hear a clicking sound, it's already too late. But there's quite a few cases that I've encountered where I would hear a clicking sound or the user would hearing some sort of clicking sound and then they can still access the data for at least another day or so or at least until they turn the machine off. Um, there has been cases, very rare cases, where even I myself have had hard drives that click and they would last for like another 5 or 10 years before they actually fell. So those are exceptions to the rule, obviously. As a norm, I would say if you start hearing clicking, you should start backing up immediately because the chances are, if you are still able to access the data, that when you turn that hard drive off, it might never start back up again. So yeah, 
when you hear clicking, back up. That should be your first and main priority is to back up, back up, and back up. All right, let's talk about light emitting diodes, in other words, LED, and status indicators. So this is something you guys will more commonly find on desktop machines, not so much on laptops, but a lot of desktop machines normally have some sort of orange or green light in the front, and it's either off all the time, or it's on all the time, or it's flickering a lot. And this is to indicate how active the hard drive is, how much activity there is on the hard drive. So if it starts flickering a lot, it's because you or someone's copying or copying from or to the hard drive a lot or cutting something from the hard drive or installing something to the hard drive. Maybe it's an antivirus scan on a hard drive. The point is something is happening on a hard drive that's basically requiring a lot of activity. Um, there's actually cases where the light will just stay on. It wouldn't even flicker, it just stays on. So that's when there's an insane amount of activity on a hard drive, something like an, an antivirus scan, for example. So when you see no LED activity, it could just be the machine is idling or nothing is happening on the hard drive at that particular moment. If you see constant LED activity, that does not necessarily mean there is something wrong. It could just be an indicator that something is wrong. Especially if you know you are not doing something on a hard drive. So if you see activity light flashing and you know you're copying or installing something, then it's very hard to know whether there's something wrong. But if you know for a fact you're not copying something, you're not installing something, there's no scans taking place in your machine and yet you see the light flashing constantly, yeah, that could be the indicator that something fishy is going on in the background. Another big concern when it comes to drive availability, guys, is missing drives in the operating system. I cannot tell you how many times I've had that, especially in my country, with all these blackouts we keep experiencing. So if the power that keeps going off and on and off and on, uh, that is not good for hard drives, especially if you look at the mechanical hard drives. You're supposed to bring a computer to a standstill properly. It's kind of like when you remove an external drive. Normally, when you want to go and unplug an external drive, you're supposed to go and click on remove safely so you can bring the hard drive to a standstill. Otherwise, if you don't, it's kind of like you're getting out of a vehicle while it's still moving. That is not a good idea. Ideally, you want to wait for the vehicle to come to a standstill first before you get out of the vehicle. Same thing of hard drives. So whether this be an internal hard drive or an external drive, it's the same can of worms, guys. So if I'm just going to be yanking out the power or experiencing constant power blackouts, like in my country, yeah, it's not a good thing for the hard drive. So ever so often, I'll start my machines. Today, I'll have six hard drives on my machine. Suddenly, tomorrow, it shows I've only got five. That's normally indicated that one of my hard drives has now failed. Doesn't mean it has, but usually that turns out to be the case. What you most certainly definitely don't want to see is when you start your computer, especially if it's a Windows machine, and it says no boot device found. Now, that is bad if you know you have not changed anything, especially when it comes to your hard drive. And yet now suddenly you see it says no boot device found. Normally on a black screen it'll indicate this. This means there's something wrong with your main hard drive that's got the operating system installed. Possibly it's completely crashed or failed, which is what happened to me the other day. Not something you or the user ever wants to experience because that's normally where your main operating system is and a lot of your most of your data is. I think for a lot of people they only have one hard drive in the machine. So when you see no boot device found, that means all the data is lost. All their photos and videos and all that kinds of stuff. Other possible issues could be just read and write failures. And then, guys, you also get what is known as a blue screen of death, more commonly known as BSOD. It also comes with other names, which I did mention to you guys in some of the other mod modules. This is also known as a memory dump. It's also known as a stop error. Now, most commonly, a blue screen of death is caused by some sort of RAM related issue, which is also a form of memory. We did cover that in a previous module, so if you guys watched module 1 and 2, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. So it's usually 9 out of 10 times caused by some sort of RAM-related issue. But it is possible to also encounter blue screens of death because of a hard drive-related issue. Well, folks, that brings us finally to the last main section in this module, the third section, which is troubleshoot system and display-related issues. So the first topic we are going to be talking about in this section is troubleshoot component issues. So let's look at something like intermittent shutdown and application crashes. So if you get a program, it just keeps shutting down on you. 
application that just keeps crashing or the computer itself just keeps crashing or shutting down on you, what could this be? It can be a lot of things. So you're going to have to try and establish first whether this is a software cause. So it could be software causes. This could be malware of some kind. You know, malware alone, there's probably like a million things it could be. It could just be that you are installing some software or you have installed some software or the user has installed some software that's just not compatible. That happens. It's completely unrelated, but yet it has an indirect influence on your system and it's causing crashes. This can also be drivers. It can also be updates of Windows. Yes, drivers and updates also causes crashes, guys. Now, it can also be a hardware issue. Maybe there's some sort of hardware. It's not compatible with something software-wise. It could be that something's overheating. It could be something that's just not compatible in general. So, yeah, all in all, it can be software causes. It can be hardware causes. Other issues we want to talk about is overheating and burning smells. Trust me, that's not something you ever want to smell near a PC is a burning smell. That's normally a very expensive smell. Overheating itself is not the worst thing. It happens to all of us at some point in time of our machines. So as time goes by, these machines, you know, become old. The heat paste, which is also known as thermal compound on a CPU, becomes hard and brittle. And after about three or five years, you're going to have to go and replace it, guys. It is a fact of life. You're going to have to do that. And also, as time goes by, um, the air vents, you know, in that, that, that sucks air in and blows air out, these are going to get clogged by dust. So all of these are things that's just going to happen. It happens. It's normal wear and tear. It's kind of like the tires on your car that become smooth over time. It's going to happen to all of us at some point in time. So when it comes to overheating, what can we do about that? You should clean your chassis for your computer. So if you've got a desktop PC, clean it. You don't have to do this every day, you know, maybe unless you're staying in a very dusty environment. So for the average Joe, this will maybe be once every three months or six months or so. Open that box, give it a bit of a cleaning. No, don't use water. We're not crazy. Maybe go and clean the heat sinks, you know, blow it out of compressed air. Um, go and clean the fans, if and where possible. Verify this airflow. You especially want to make sure you do that with a laptop. Laptops have much, much smaller air vents, and they've got these little meshes that cover the air intake and out outlets. So they're a lot more prone to get, you know, dust in there that basically blocks the airflow inwards and outwards. So the laptop's going to overheat because it's not dissipating heat as properly as it's supposed to. And when it starts overheating, you're going to get, you know, less and less and less performance out of that laptop. To the point where it might actually shut down on you if it gets too hot. Yep, it happens. <clears throat> All right, and let's talk about physical damage to components. So when it comes to physical damage, the things you need to be most concerned about in this section is bent Pins. This can be for a lot of things. Most commonly, we're referring to the CPU, boys and girls. So the CPUs, some of them have the pins on the CPU, something we covered with you guys in module two. Some of them have the pins on the motherboard. So if the pins are on the motherboard, that'll be an LGA, a LAN grid array. If the pins are on the CPU, that'll be a PGA, pin grid array. So PGA is more common with AMD CPUs. LGA is more common with Intel CPUs, at least at this point in time, that's the case. Either way, potato, potato, a bent pin is not something you or the user wants to experience because that's normally a very expensive oopsie. Some cases, you are very lucky, you can just bend it back, but usually, yeah, something is going to have to be replaced. It could also be a damaged cable or connector. This could be a power cable, it could be a data cable. Other things that could possibly cause physical damage is component or adapter seating. So when we talk about seating, we're referring to the actual slot which your components slide into on the motherboard usually. This could be the slot in which your RAM chips or modules slide into. It can be the PCI or PCIe slots in which your graphics card or expansion cards slide into. It can be any kind of slot like that. And then lastly, guys, something we don't really have a lot of control over, capacitor swelling. The good news is the new modern motherboards have less and less capacitors, hardly any, quite frankly. Where the older motherboards from 5, 10 years ago, they had like a, like a whole wallet full of capacitors. These essentially bring up the voltage where resistors bring down the voltage on certain components on the motherboard. Now they store electricity, and as time goes by, some of them will start swelling, and you know, there's actually cases where these things can even explode in some cases. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much about exploding, you know, but it is a bit of a concern when they start swelling. Anywho, clicking over to our next topic here, troubleshoot performance issues. So 
it is a new topic, but it's also not a new topic because if you think about it, we have kind of hit and run on some of these topics to a certain degree already in this module. So in this specific topic, we're going to be covering things like checking for overheating. So when it comes to overheating, guys, like I said, that can be a lot of things. It could really be something as simple as the PC has gotten old, the heat paste or thermal compound in a CPU has gotten old and brittle. This normally starts happening after three or five years. And I normally need to remove the heat sink with its fan, clean the old heat paste of the CPU and of the fan, apply a new a new little bit, you know, a new little, little batch onto the CPU. Normally, basically, the size of your, your pinky nail will be enough. Put in a little circular format, put the heat sink and the fan back, and then your ACES again. Also, ensure that the air vents, you know, is clean. Make sure the fans are clean. It could also be that your CPU is experiencing throttling. Some cases, when a PC starts experiencing overheating, it'll automatically start throttling to reduce the heat. So yeah, it's kind of like your car. Your car also sometimes do that. So if your car starts overheating, it'll either cut the engine or it'll start throttling the engine to reduce it from overheating, you know, to cause any permanent damage. You can also go and check misconfiguration. So when you or the user's machine starts misperforming, especially if it's underperforming, it could just really be a, a setting of some kind. Just the other day, this happened to me on my own machine personally, guys. Believe it or not, it happens to the best of us. And this was something as simple as a power issue, a power configuration issue on my machine. So what happened was I did not have my laptop on a charger. And normally, I don't run my laptop on the default power option that says recommended. I don't run that one. There's another power option that says high performance. And there's another one that says power saver mode. At least those are the three default ones besides the ones you go and make yourself. Now, I always run my laptop on high performance, but on this particular day, I was nowhere near an electrical socket of any kind. I had my laptop on the go, and I wanted to make the battery last as long as possible. So I went to the battery, the, the power options on my machine. I went to power saver, which massively reduces the power, you know, consumption of the laptop, but it also massively reduces the performance of the laptop. Less power means less performance. And uh, what started happening to me, eventually when I plugged my laptop back in, um, it kept running on power saver, power saver, because I manually went and put it on power saver mode. And for the life of me, I could not figure out why my laptop was so freaking laggy and non-responsive. And then eventually after about a day or so, I realized, oh, shucks, I forgot to change the setting back. Oopsie daisy, it happens. It honestly, God happens to anyone. It can happen to anyone, and it happens to me as well. So, yeah, just because I am training you guys this stuff doesn't mean this stuff doesn't happen to me. All of this stuff happens to me just as much as it happens to you or anyone else. We're in the same boat here, guys. All right, and then when it comes to checking your misconfigurations, if it's not for your machine, I would say ask the user what has changed. What did they change? If they're not sure, you can go and check this in various locations. You can go and check the logs of the machine if need be. One of the logs you can go and check is the logs in Event Viewer, if you folks are familiar with Event Viewer. Event Viewer is a log keeping mechanism that's built into Windows, both the client operating systems as well as the server operating systems. It's completely for free. It's built into all operating systems. So it's simply a matter of just figuring it out and using it, I suppose. Lastly, guys, verifying the problem. Now, if you want to verify the problem, one of the ways you can go about doing that would be to use diagnostic software to quantify the performance loss. So if you or the customer suspect there's a performance loss of some kind, but you're not 100% sure, or if you are sure, but you're not sure of how much of a performance loss there might be, you might need to resort to using some sort of diagnostic software just to go and quantify the exact amount of performance that's being lost. So if this is, is this like a mere 5%, is this like 100% performance loss? What is the actual amount that's being lost here now? And then guys, identify best opportunity for upgrade. And this could be for you, but quite frankly, I think what CompTIA has got in mind here, this is more for your potential customers, your potential users and clients. So if your user or your customer is complaining their machine is slow and you've done everything within your power and you see there's still no dice, it's still not really cutting it, you might want to see this as an opportunity to sell the customer something, sell them more hard drive space if they need more storage, sell them more RAM if they need more speed, sell them a bigger CPU if they need more speed, that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying you have to, but if you are somewhere along the line working with sales in any form of way, and if you're getting commission, 
this might be seen as a great opportunity. So if someone's complaining about something not working, I don't have enough space, my machine is too slow, that kinds of nonsense, this might be a golden opportunity for those of you to, well, sell something. All right, folks, and this is the second last topic, at least I think it's the second last topic for this module. Troubleshooting inaccurate system date and inaccurate system time. Now, this sounds like a fairy tale, but let me tell you, it's a real thing. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen nonetheless. Now, I'm not sure if any of you guys have ever seen this, but if you ever opened a computer, especially if it's a, a desktop, you would maybe notice there's like a coin cell battery on the motherboard. There's actually a picture for you guys. There's a picture. So it's, it's usually either the bottom left or the bottom right of this machine. That coin cell battery, oh, you can buy them in any store where you can buy batteries, they normally last approximately about 10 years. Now, there has been cases where I would see these batteries only last about two or five years. There's been cases where I've seen them last 15 to 20 years. It's, it's kind of random, but I would say the norm is about more or less 10 years. So if you get one that lasts you only two years or three years, the chances are you, the user, probably got a dud. I don't know, maybe the manufacturer used old stock. There can be many reasons for that. Now, when that battery goes flat, a bunch of problems start occurring. One of those is incorrect system date and incorrect system time. Not so much the date always, but especially the time. So if you or the user starts experiencing the clock that keeps, that keeps falling behind, that's one of the first symptoms of a battery that's flat. So it's not completely dead yet. So let's say it is 12 o'clock the afternoon now. And for some reason, your machine or the user's machine says it's only 11 o'clock now. And then you go and correct the time and after a couple of days or after a week or so, it starts falling behind again. You correct it again and it falls behind again. And the more you do it, the more it starts falling behind and the quicker it starts falling behind and the further it starts falling behind. That is all signs and symptoms of a coin cell battery on the motherboard that is now becoming flat. It's running out of juice, guys. So yeah, that's, that's all it is. You simply just need to replace this battery. It's easy, it's quick. Have you ever wondered how a machine is able to remember certain settings and certain information like the date and the time, even though you've turned it off and plugged it out? If you look, like a, if you look at it, something like a desktop PC, where you are able to plug out the power cord behind the box, and when you plug it in eventually, for some reason, the date and the time is still 100% accurate. How the heck is that possible? It is all because of this coin cell battery on the motherboard, guys. It helps the machine remember the time, it helps you remember the date. And that's not the only thing it helps you remember. That's not, that's that's unfortunately the only topic that we're discussing here is the date and the time. But it also helps the machine remember other things like the boot order. So this computer is config, com, uh, currently configured to boot from the hard drive first and then to go and check for a DVD and then to go and check for a memory stick. Well, if that coin cell battery becomes flat, the machine is not going to remember what the boot order is. It doesn't remember that you're going to have to go and replace the battery to get it to remember what the boot order is. So it's going to start causing all kinds of shenanigans. Now on your own personal machine or a single user machine, it's not the worst of things. It's just very inconvenient, quite frankly. But on a server, let me tell you, this can spell disaster. Especially if this happens to be a very specific server like your domain controller. Now servers in general, the coin cell battery, you don't want it to go flat. But if this happens to be specifically the domain controller, everything, all the other servers that are on the same domain that link to the domain controller, they get their time from the domain controller. They synchronize with the time of the domain controller. So if the domain controller server, if that battery goes flat, trust me, it is anarchy, guys. You do not want to find yourself in that situation. And it happened to me once or twice in my life. And um, yeah, let me just say it was a disaster. It was a mission of note to go and fix that. All right, folks. Finally, we're moving on to our last topic for Module 3. That would be troubleshooting missing video issues. Now, just on its own, that can mean a lot of things. This could just be your laptop display not displaying anything. It could be a normal computer monitor not displaying anything. It could be a projector not displaying anything. It's a lot, of, I mean, you get many kinds of display, many kinds of videos, but for the most part, this specific topic is based on projectors when CompTIA explains this. I just want to put it out there. It's not me. That's the course. That's CompTIA. But in real life, I, I'm just going to mention this could actually be anything. So a lot of these steps are actually applicable 
to real life things as well. So the first possible thing could be physical cabling issues. Now that applies to everything, not just projectors. Now if your screen or your user screen doesn't want to come on, it can honest to God just really be a cabling issue, guys. It could be that it's not connected properly. This could be behind the screen. It can be at the actual um, computer box itself or the actual laptop itself. It's really just not plugged in at all or it's just not plugged in properly. And when this happens, you're either going to see nothing or you're going to see a very weird image, like maybe all blue, or it's going to be very blue, very green, very red, very yellow. When you see a, 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 an image on the screen, but it's um, you know distorted in a sense of color, you see a lot of a certain color, a lot of red, or a lot of red, or a lot of blue, a lot of green, that normally indicates that the cable is connected, but it's not connected properly, or some of the pins are damaged, or some of the wires in that cable is damaged. This is especially common with a VGA cable. That's the ones with the blue connectors, which are analog analog signals. The ones with the white connectors, which are seen as DVI connectors, those are digital signals. So if especially with VGA cables, if they're not plugged in properly, or the cables are damaged, or the pins are damaged, it's very common to start experiencing an image, which has got a lot of a certain type of color, a lot of green, red, blue, or yellow. If you see that, it could be that the cable is damaged, guys. So yeah, all in all, it could be that it's not connected properly, it could be damaged connectors, or it could just be a cable performance issue. That's a very unlikely one I've seen, but I have seen that a couple of times with some people, where maybe you are plugging in an HDMI cable into your laptop, and the other end is plugged into your TV, or you're plugging an HDMI cable into your graphics card, and the other end is plugged into your TV, and it was working fine before, and now suddenly it stops working. This could be as a result of the cable's performance. You need to get yourself a higher performance HDMI cable. Yes, there is actually such a thing, guys. Now, the next topic we've got here, which is more specific to projectors, is burnt out bulb. So as time goes by, with a lot of projectors, well, actually all projectors, you'll see the image starts giving more dim and more dim. You know, how quickly this happens depends on the make and the model of the projector, how big the projector is, and also how much you actually use the projector and abuse the projector, if you want to go and call it that. All of these factors have an influence on the lifespan of that bulb. So the bulb in the projector is what actually gives you the image that it projects. And as time goes by, you're going to see this image starts getting more faint and to a point where it starts actually becoming blurry. It doesn't matter how much you focus on the projector. It just doesn't want to show you a crispy, clear image like it did in the beginning. This is a result of the bulb that's getting worn out and that, that needs to be replaced. It's normally a good idea to start replacing the bulb before it gives in. And you'll find it with most projectors, even the cheap ones these days, before the bulb even fails, it'll start displaying a message when you turn the projector on. It says you need to replace the bulb or the bulb is due for replacement or something in that regard. The majority of projectors, even the cheap ones that does that, does that these, these days, guys. And then lastly, the very, very last subtopic, intermittent projector shutdown. It can be quite a few things, but most commonly, guys, if I find a projector that just keeps shutting down on me, whether it be mine or a user's, this can be due to the projector overheating. Yes, they can actually overheat. If you look at the picture there, you'll find this one's got little vents in the front. Now, in real life, you'll find these vents can be anywhere, the bottom, on the front, on the sides, the back, maybe all of the above. Uh, and you'll hear that these projectors actually have a fan in them. When you turn them on, you can actually hear the fan spinning because these projectors, believe it or not, get very very hot so when they don't um, dissipate the heat properly that can also have them just shut down automatically just like your computer just like your car that we spoke of in the other uh, previous modules a projector does the same thing to prevent damage if and when it detects it's getting too hot it can in fact shut itself down automatically this can be as a result of the fan is not working properly or at all it can be as a result of the air intake or outlet vents that's blocked by dust. Yes, it happens because these projectors are very often on the roof or the ceilings where it's very dusty. So they actually get clogged very, very quickly and easily, guys. Now, if that, if you've checked all of that and you know for a fact, okay, it's not the fan, it is not the vents, and the projector keeps shutting down on you continuously as well, it could just be a timer. Some of these projectors have a timer. So if there's no inactivity on the projector for a certain period of time, they also shut down, you know, to basically avoid wasting the bulb's lifespan and avoid you wasting power for the most part. 
All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this module. I hope you guys have learned something. I hope you guys have enjoyed this module. If you have learned something, do me a favor and drop a comment down below and let me know what you've learned. It's always interesting and fun to see what people have learned if they've learned something. And if you'd like to know when I release the next module being module four for this course, remember to subscribe, otherwise you might miss that. And like I said in the beginning of the video, guys, if you don't mind, give the video a like. It does help me when you guys do that. And lastly, before you guys disappear on me, just a special thank you to the Patreon sponsors, the PayPal sponsors, and quite frankly, all the sponsors of any kind that help me and that sponsor this channel in any form of way. I really appreciate you guys. So there is a list of some of the Patreon sponsors and the PayPal sponsors that are, that are currently sponsoring the channel. I also want to just extend a thank you to those of you that are clicking on the thanks button below the videos. And also just those of you that just buy me a coffee and a milkshake. So if any of you guys would like to sponsor the channel, you can find all of that information in the video description down below. The Patreon, the PayPal, if you want to buy me a coffee or a milkshake, if you just want to, you know, click on the thanks button below the video, whatever, you know, floats your boat, you can find any and all that information down below in the video description with all the timestamps and all the topics covered in this video. Alrighty, folks, I shall see you all in Module 4 of the A-plus course.